How to Love Clubs, right. 1890 to 1937, um, died in poverty, uh, of, well, basically of complications brought on by extreme starvation. Never had a book published in his lifetime. Um, and uh, basically was known to very few outside the reason of the pulp magazine Weird Tales uh, and to a certain extent astounding stories, the, the science fiction magazine in which he, he had a, a couple of late um, short novels published. Um, now he is, I think, generally recognised as being one of the most influential writers in the field, to my mind actually, quite possibly the most important single writer of well, let's say horror fiction for the moment, depending on how you define that, of the 20th century. Obviously, you know, he's got a lot of competition there. What makes Lovecraft so important? Uh, I think possibly two things. One of which is that he spent his entire career trying to work out what he regards as the perfect form for what he called the weird tale, what I will, I will call for short time to say the horror story and also that he tried on every possible method and voice and structure that, that he could develop for himself. And uh, now many of his detractors, and also I have to say quite a number of his admirers, uh, I, I, I will confess myself of being guilty of this uh, to begin with myself back in the early days when I imitated Lovecraft more half a century ago, um, that he's, he's regarded as having only one style and that style being like an empurpled Edgar Allan Poe. I mean, really very few things to be further from the truth. In fact, Lovecraft modulated his prose uh, to such an extent, it's actually very difficult to find most of the, 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 the what you might call the, the parody Lovecraft in his work. There are stories, certainly, where, where his work does become, his writing, I think, does become extremely florid, but that's certainly not his mature work. Now, funnily enough, I just happened to see today on, on Reddit, the, um, the, uh, an internet site, which is actually devoted to a fair amount of literary discussion, and there's actually a, a sub-heading uh, about devoted the title to Lovecraft and Lovecrafting in fiction, where somebody has, has apparently written a story, quite a good story actually, uh, that he says is in imitation of Lovecraft, I would say rather a tribute to Lovecraft as an assignment in, I assume, an American high school. And he's asked people how he can improve it. One, one person said, well, find out what adjectives Lovecraft used most often and put all those in. That seems to me to be absolute the worst piece of advice <laughs> you could possibly have. And it's one I myself followed in my <laughs> mid-teens. Believe me, you don't want to know about the results. If, 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 if it's question time, I'm not going to use up the time now on this, but if it's question time, you want me to demonstrate just how atrocious Lovecraft imitation can be, I will do so for my own early work. But that, that, that's to come. It's a treat later, OK? <laughs> but let me address... I, I know that, you know, I've been introduced to... Well, I'm a horror writer, though, and I know that you're... By that token, I'm expected to write to talk about Lovecraft as a horror writer, which indeed he was. But let me let me let me try and guide a little bit toward what I think is the overriding theme of this, of, of well, writing on the wall this year and certainly of this evening, which is science fiction. See, Lovecraft certainly started as a writer of of gothic horror. His 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 great admiration was Fred Allan Poe, um, and I'll, I'll quote if I may. Um, a little bit as he, he cited from Poe, not cited actually, he, he, was, he was describing the, the fall of the House of Usher in, in his own, that is Lovecraft's own essay, Supernatural Horror and Literature, which is actually one of the first great overviews of supernatural horror um, and still a key text. And of, of the fall of the House of Usher, he says this, that it demonstrates the essential details to emphasise the precise incongruities of conceits to select as preliminaries or concomitants to horror, the exact incidents and allusions to throw out innocently in advance as symbols or prefigurings of each major step toward the hideous dinamon to come, the night adjustments of cumulative force and the unerring accuracy and linkage of parts which went for faultless unity throughout and thunderous effectiveness at the climactic moment, the delicate nuances of scenic and landscape value to select an establishing and sustain the desired mood and vitalising the desired illusion. Now, in fact, well, I think you can say pretty certainly about any writer, if they're writing about other writers, they're talking about themselves. 
more often than not. And clearly, one of the things that Lovecraft is talking about in this, in this essay are his own ambitions for the field. Um, one of the things he, 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 he counseled to writers within it was, was documentary realism. And I'll just throw out this parenthetically that I regard the, the by far the greatest Lovecraftian film ever made as the Blair Witch Project, which is, is, is the, one of the great documentary style horror films. And I mean, again, going right back to Poe, um, where Poe you know, would write in a documentary style, the facts in the case of Monsieur Valdemar, for instance. Now, one strength of Lovecraft, I'm, I'm going quite fast, but I see I'm already halfway through my time. Um, one of the great strengths of Lovecraft, it seems to me, is that he, he unites the British and American traditions that lead up to him. So from America we have Poe, certainly, and also Ambrose Bierce with very sardonic, dark, macabre humour. Um, from Britain, uh, Arthur Macken, certainly, and certainly Algernon Blackwood. Arthur Macken, well, at least possibly the greatest weird tale of all time, the white people, but, but equally uh, Blackwood can be said to compete with the Willows and other stories too, um, both of which have this tremendous sense of cosmic terror and the numinous, which I think is what Lovecraft was very often aiming for. And it seems to be that the greatest supernatural work in the field very often aim for a sense of awe, and that this, 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 this striving for, if you like, the luminous that, that gives it its particular power. Now, I said I think Lovecraft begins as a, a writer of Gothic horror fiction, um, and he perfects it, I think, in, in ways that have not previously been perfected. Um, probably the greatest story of that kind in his work is The Rats in the Walls, which I analyzed it considerable length in the Morphologies book. So I won't do that now because I hope you folks will have already got the Morphologies anthology that you will buy it and, and read the stuff that, I, that I've said in there about Lovecraft because I don't have time to go into all that because I did look at the three of his stories in considerable, very close detail. Um, the Rats in the Walls is, is, is basically a, a tale of um, an American with British lineage who returns to Exxon Priory in Britain and who discovers his, there's, a, he, there's a dreadful ancestral secret that leads him further and further down beneath the priors into the subcells and the vaults beneath, which in a particularly telling moment appear to have been ch chiseled from beneath by presumably creatures that are not human. However, the, the family itself uh, proves to have bred huge subhuman creatures in the vaults for reasons of their own. Um, and it's a remarkable story about language. I think if I, ch if I wanted to choose one Lovecraft story above all to demonstrate his care with language, it would be that tale. And the way he modulates um, the prose from, you know, the extremely sober and documentary -ish, um, to, to very gradual hints and adjectives that, you know, um, begin to bring on the, the, the ominous secret. And we finally do get, I think, just one paragraph up at the very end, uh, which is, you know, a, a, a huge extended uh, lyrical um, fantastic metaphor about the, 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 the creature that lives at the centre of the earth. Um, but I mean, this has been built up to throughout the story, throughout, you know, 10, 12,000 words, I suppose. I think we can allow him that one bit of extremely purple prose because it has been so, I, said, I, would, I would use, the, well, it's not my term, actually, the great Fritz Leiber used to apply it to Lovecraft. He used to say that Lovecraft orchestrated his prose in the way that, you know, music is orchestrated. You, you take a phrase and then you develop it, an image and you develop it. This is certainly what Lovecraft very frequently did. However, and this is why I suppose it's particularly relevant to, to, to tonight's theme, um, from that sort of story, uh, from really the, the mid-twenties onward, Lovecraft begins to, to marry the gothic horror story and the, psych psych the science fiction story. So that whereas in the early stories the, 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 mon the, the, the manifestation, I suppose the best term really, um, tend to be spectral or fantastic or often a product of human degeneration into the monstrous. Um, fr from the mid-twenties onwards, they, they, they become much more alien. They, they, they express much more strongly his, his sense of the universe, the enormous, um, not so much inimical as indifferent place. Um, the sort of thing you can actually find in a, 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 some of the late works of a science fiction writer like our very own, Olaf Stapledon, 
whom Lovecraft actually didn't read until very late in Lovecraft's life, although he did read and enjoy H.G. Wells, you know, the, the time machine in the mid-20s, the mid and I think the War of the Worlds shortly after. Um, in a story like the, uh, if I can pronounce it right, as Lovecraft uh, 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 indicated once to pronounce this, the call of Kluthu, um, the, 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 the thing is now from, you know, it, it has come from out there, somewhere w way beyond uh, the known universe, and um, has, has, has basically has been buried at the bottom of the sea, but, well not buried, but, you know, uh, trapped at the bottom of the sea in, in its own city by, by, by the, the oceans. And it's interesting that Lovecraft, um, as he often would subsequent to that, he takes uh, a contemporary event, in this case it was a, uh, an undersea earthquake which, which caused rising of land, and, and I think incorporate, not only incorporates that in the story, but in fact it's, it's one of the actual seeds of the story. Um, previously he had ideas he wanted to develop, but it was that that particularly sent him onward. Um, he, he always thought his greatest story, and I would probably agree with this actually, is The Colour Out of Space, which finds it it's the, the, by far the, the purest expression of this sense of his, of, of you know, the, the, the universe out there as being utterly alien and unknowable. Um, it is, as, he, as, as the story itself says, it was simply a colour out of space. It's an unknown colour. Now, clearly there's more to it than that. There's something sentient that is represented by this. But it, it, it's not, you see, this is one of the creatures about nothing that he, that he so often said things were, you know, indescribable or unspeakable. Now, you know, this, those terms do show up now and then, but he very seldom uses that get out. It, he, he's, it's, it's conveyed much more thoroughly than that in, in most of his work. I mean, some of the work actually, the, 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 the alien, whatever it may be, is very thoroughly in described in considerable detail. I mean, the Dunwich horror is a particular example of that. Um, so really, he, he goes on from the color out of space through stories like I was going to I was going to use this as a text, but I actually probably don't think I've got time to go into it in any detail. But the Whisperer in Darkness, uh, which is another such where initially, as, as very often happens in this field, I'm talking now about horror fiction generally, uh, it's the landscape more often than not that is the source of the inspiration for a story. And Lovecraft was a, I mean, the, one of the other great uh, myths about Lovecraft, completely wrong, was he was, he was virtually a hermit. Quite the contrary, he traveled around America as much as he could, but as he could afford, met all the people he could, uh, all of his correspondent and friends he could possibly meet. So, you know, don't, don't go with the side that he was some sort of strange guy locked away in a room in Providence. He wasn't, he got out, uh, met his friends, looked at, you know, saw all the America that he possibly could. In the case of The Whisper in Darkness, apparently, originally he wanted to express how the landscape of Vermont made him feel. Um, but he was, he progressed with this story in the early 30s, fits and starts, and then Pluto was discovered, the planet. And he was, you know, delighted by this. And from, from raving to his friends' correspondence about the fact this was, you know, a wonderful new, you know, he'd hoped during his lifetime for one new plant to be discovered, and here it was. And then a couple of months later, we found him saying to people, somebody ought to write a story about this plant, you know? And then, you know, a month later, having you know, struggled with this story, The Whisper in Darkness, he incorporates that into the, himself. And this is where, in many cases, you know, that some of the sense of the power of the story from this notion of a lightless planet out there comes from. Now, um, I must at least, before, I've got another five minutes here, I think, um, I must at least begin to address one of the more contentious, contentious issues about Lovecraft. I'm sure some of you here are aware of, and possibly some of you expect me to address, um, which is Lovecraft as racist, because there's no question whatsoever he was a racist, certainly in terms of his attitudes, in many of his declarations, particularly his correspondence, and certainly in some of his stories. Now, some writers like Alan Moore and China Mieville, among others, um, argue that this informs all of his fiction, the sense of the, you know, the other as alien and, and monstrous. Um, and th there certainly is some truth that, you know, you can certainly find that, and in some of his worst fiction, there's a terrible story called Medusa's Coil, which I'm sure 
one could perhaps justify, not justify, because it, it doesn't bear justifying, but certainly could say that it, it's a collaboration. It was a story he revised and he didn't seem to be very interested in. It's still a pretty offensive story. On the other hand, I'm not so sure that arguing that, you know, crab creatures from Yugoth uh, are quite the same thing as, you know, actual human beings. And if, to view these as being other um, is really, it seems to be, not the same thing. But what I do want to say, this is possibly my, my, my final major point, is that as he moved into science fiction, something very interesting happens. And it seems to me that while it's not, it's not a direct progression, it would be, it would, and in fact, you know, there's reversion throughout his later work. But there tends to be this movement toward embracing the alien in a variety of different ways. I mean, from something like the rats in the walls, where you know what you discover about yourself is is the ultimate horror, or into a sort of like the outsider, which it may or may not be a sort of disguised autobiographical metaphor of discovering that you yourself are the monster. And um, we then get something like in. You see, in, in The Whisper in Darkness, we get a character saying this, which seems to me to be very significant. What I, this is one of the characters writing a letter to the narrator of the story. What I have thought morbid and shameful and ignominious is in reality awesome and mind-expanding and even glorious, <coughs> my previous estimate being merely a phase of man's eternal tendency to faint and fear and shrink from the utterly different. Now, that does seem to me to be something of a reversal of some of his attitudes. Um, and in, in a, la a slightly later story, At the Mountains of Madness, the, um, the, 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 the creatures in that, which are completely you know, inhuman and not remotely humanoid, um, at one point the narrator says, well, but after all, they were men. Again, there seems to be this acceptance of the, of the other that's, that's very important and that is quite specifically um, an aspect of his development of his work into a sort of science fiction. Um, there's probably a great deal more to say, but I think I would just end by saying two things. Read Lovecraft, and please do read Morphologies, because um, I said a great deal more than that, and I've got time to say now, but perhaps at question time, I may have a chance to say more. Thank you very much.